Good evening. We'll call to order the November meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees. Please help me start the meeting with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item of business is roll call and recognition of visitors. Ms. Slicht. Okay, so this evening's visitors include Roberta Eveslage, Bob Bergeson, Dick Carter, and Frank Sotelar. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the next item, I want to announce at the end of the regular agenda, we're going to have a one-hour executive session. I think it's fair to tell the trustees up front and the audience up front, we'll have a one-hour executive session on security matters on campus. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, we're missing Trustee Lindstrom tonight who has a, a Kansas Turnpike Authority Board retreat and meeting. He's on his way back from Wichita and may join us later. And Trustee Sharp is out of town on business. Um, with that, the next item on the agenda is the open forum. The open forum section of the board agenda is a time when members of the community can provide comments to the board. These are, there is, will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people intend to speak, in which case a board may limit uh, speaking time to less than five minutes. In order to rec do be recognized, speakers must uh, register at the door at each board meeting and prior to the open for agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers should be respectful and civil and should not address matters related to individual personnel matters with the college. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggestion processes or are otherwise subject to review by the college or the board. There are no registered speakers tonight for the open forum session, so we'll move on to the next item of our agenda, which is awards and recognition. I think Dr. Sopcich has a very important, unexpected, unanticipated surprise announcement. Well, after that buildup, thank you, Trustee Musil. <laughs> um, I do have an award to present. And this, um, you know, every October we have our Lace Up for Learning 5K. Several hundred people from the community will get out there and run with the proceeds going for scholarship. It's now my pleasure to, um, uh, to give one of the awards to one of our trustees who, partic who participated in that 5K, and not just participated, but also came in second place in his age category, and I will not divulge the age category, but Trustee Cook, it's my honor to give this to you. <laughs> I'm pleased that you uh, regarded the age sensitivity. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Student Senate Report. Student Senate President, Mr. Rives, thank you again for being here. Well, I would like to thank you again for allowing me to come share with you uh, what Student Senate is doing. It is always a pleasure to come to these meetings. Uh, several other senators are joining me tonight. Uh, Chris Starr, Tak Tai, uh, Vivian Law, and Tobey Ayaji. How do you say your last name? Ayaji. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, last week, Student Senate hosted a town hall meeting about campus safety, which I talked about at the last meeting, uh, with a panel of excellent uh, speakers. At a time when campus safety is critical on, and is on everyone's minds, uh, the meeting was very helpful and informative. I would like to thank those of you here who attended and uh, also everyone who helped to make it possible. So thank you very much for that. Uh, now through December 3rd, Student Senate is hosting JCCC Gives, a program which gives back to JCCC families in need during the holiday season. Uh, we have received nominations for 10 families with 33 people in those families and the requests are for a total of 135 gifts. Uh, different individuals, departments, and even student-run clubs on campus have adopted families, uh, and we've already begun receiving gifts. The Student Senate is also raising funds to purchase gifts uh, for those who have been nominated. So far, we've raised over $800, uh, all of which will go towards JCCC gifts. And it really is heartwarming to see the generosity of everyone in the JCCC community, and uh, the knowledge of helping people through the holiday season really makes every penny worth it. So I'd like to thank you again for allowing me to come share with you. It is always an honor to be here. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Rice? 
Uh, before you leave the podium, I want to let you know that through your first contact with Trustee Ingram and uh, her contacting me and we're working together, we have solicited donations to JCCC Gives from the administration and the Board of Trustees. And as of today, we either have collected or have pledges totaling $620. And Ms. Schlicht is going to collect those monies and will deliver those uh, to the student, student Senate so that you can include those along with the $800 you have. And I'm, I want to thank everybody up here and everybody in the room that has contributed to that. If you haven't contributed and you would like to, uh, Terry will be here uh, after the meeting <laughs> to take your pledge or to take your check. Um, we're very excited about helping uh, those 10 families. Uh, I think it will, be a, it will be a very good thing. I also might mention that with respect to safety and security, the Faculty Senate and the Faculty Association have both addressed this topic. The Student Senate has addressed this topic and, and be assured that the Board of Trustees are looking at that as well and that is the topic of our of our executive session this afternoon. When we move into executive session, it also often seems very conspiratorial and secretive. Um, it is not a good thing to discuss security measures in public, and the Kansas Open, Rec Open Meetings Act allows us to discuss those in executive session so that we don't tell everybody in the world, including the bad guys, um, what we might be thinking about how to try to protect this campus. But uh, vigilance, and if you see something, say something, is a good watchword, I think, for all of us. Any other comments? Thank you very much, and thank you other student senators for, for coming today. Thank you so much. Followed by our college lobbyist report, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, too, hope to be brief this evening. I'm saving my energy for the coming months of 2016. Uh, at the end of October, that represents the fourth straight month in a row where revenues have not met expectations. Uh, at the state level. That shouldn't come as a surprise to you. The October uh, number was $11 million down for the month. That brings the four-month total, uh, four months into the state's fiscal year, to about $72 million uh, off the mark. There was about a $70 million uh, cushion, give or take, uh, that, uh, that uh, legislators had left in the budget to allow for um, crises or problems in the budget. Clearly, we've not met those <coughs> marks, and uh, the Consensus Revenue Estimating Group met uh, the 6th of November to take a look at the uh, budget for the state um, and make some uh, adjustments or some projections, if you will, uh, which they did end up making some adjustments. The numbers were off about $159 million for the current year and $194 million for 2017. And so they'll be making uh, some recommended adjustments through the governor's allotment authority and through special authority that was created in, in one of the House bills uh, that, that dealt with the budget. Uh, probably the biggest loser is going to be KDOT to the tune of about $48 million, just, just under $48 million. Uh, there are some other funds and fee sweeps that will be adjusted uh, to ultimately get to a, a number that, that, uh, that leaves a few dollars in the bank account, at least. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, for the rest of this current fiscal year, which ends June 30th. Um, the budget group or the estimating uh, group will meet again in April to take another snapshot of what the budget looks like. Uh, and probably if things continue to move in that fashion like they have uh, in past uh, or at least recent years with respect to the budget, uh, we'll start getting down to uh, work in earnest that last week of April, the first week of, of May. Um, there are still questions uh, out there in the, in the uh, public policy community about just exactly how long the, the session will go. It is an election year. That's going to have an impact on a lot of things uh, that occur in Topeka this, this coming year. We hear that it's going to be a short session. Um, there are some indicators that point to uh, there's no way that it could be a short session. So we'll, we'll have to uh, see what, what happens when folks come back in January and, and, um, and sort of the direction things uh, will go. We anticipate about that time, um, and again, give or take uh, a few weeks, uh, that, that we may have a court decision uh, on the equity portion of the um, school finance lawsuit, uh, the Gannon lawsuit. Uh, the court heard arguments on the same day that the, the revenue estimating group met on, uh, on the 6th. And uh, an hour was allotted to the state, and an hour was allotted to the plaintiffs. And uh, for those that either uh, listened on the live stream or, or were there, or if you followed the tweets, it was it was pretty interesting, um, according to those that were that were tweeting from the event. The um, uh, by way of just updates uh, and information from the interim committees, 
Uh, there were a number of committees that met early in November, specifically ones that, that I'll be talking about today are, are the tax committee. Um, and that, that committee reviewed uh, many of the, the sales tax exemptions, other tax policy or exemptions that exist within tax policy, as well as economic development type of exemptions. Uh, everything is going to be on the table. Uh, I will just remind you uh, that as legislators continue to look for money and, and taking a look at exemptions and what those exemptions can produce, uh, the last time that there was a serious review and, and a study commission on this, we ended up adding two to three additional sales tax exemptions to that list. I think times are a little different than they were um, 10, 12 years ago, uh, but, but I just say that, that, that history often repeats itself and, and we'll be watching that process as it, as it moves along as well because there are a number of those exemptions that could impact uh, the college. The um, Special Committee on Ethics, Elections, and Local Government met in October. There were no real recommendations that came forward from any of the interested parties on a further amending election law. Um, the Secretary of State's office intends to, if they have not already done so, issue a memorandum um, that ex uh, extends spring uh, office holders through uh, the fall of 2017. Uh, that's, when the, uh, that's when the first round of folks that will be impacted by the move from spring to fall elections will take place. Uh, but there were no, no real um, earth-shaking recommendations that came from the municipalities or from the county government or from those that might be impacted by the move from uh, the spring to the fall. That doesn't take away the concern that there might not still be tweaks to uh, the law introduced that would um, take the elections from nonpartisan to partisan or, or adjust uh, in other methods. So we'll be watching for that as well. That group comes back um, here in the next, uh, they'll meet on the 20th. Uh, to develop their recommendations uh, to the 2016 legislature. The other thing that that group will be doing is taking a look at the number of local units of government in Kansas. We often uh, have a bad reputation for having a, what appears to be an exorbitant amount of local units of government. That's because the way things were set up when Kansas became a state developed not only the, the uh, municipalities or the county governments, but also library districts, water districts, drainage districts, fire districts and the list goes on townships. And so there, there's this appearance that there's a, an overwhelming number. We've had that, that look into that uh, uh, list of local units of government before too, uh, but we'll do that again on the 20th. And, uh, and then we'll know a little bit better on what the committee recommendations look like for the 2016 session with respect to uh, local government. I think that one of the things that, that we saw also last week is a little glimpse into some of the um, activity that we can see in the 2016 session. Um, though not uncommon, it's not a regular occurrence, the um, House leadership shuffled some of the committee members um, out, of, out of leadership positions and in, into and onto other committees. I've given a list of some of the local folks, uh, just for your information, I haven't, I haven't listed the exhaustive. Uh, group that uh, were moved around. But I think that that uh, sheds a little bit of light on the type of activity and what we can expect to see uh, as far as um, uh, the action and activity that we'll have in the, in the 2016 session. I'll just kind of leave it at that and, and let you um, think about that for a while. As we prepare to um, close this year and enter the legislative session. Once again, we're conducting the uh, legislative breakfast that proved so effective in, in that continuing dialogue with our uh, county elected, or our, our Johnson County elected delegates for the, to, for the state legislature. And uh, those, those invitations have gone out and we're beginning to receive uh, RSVPs back on those. And I think that you've been notified of the dates and, and we look forward to your participation as you are able to to be a part of those conversations. Those of you that have been to them um, know how valuable they can be as far as just having a conversation um, about some of the, the issues. And sometimes the, the conversation is not about the issues. It's, it's just having the conversation and opening those doors uh, that prove to um, improve those relationships with our, with our elected delegates. Finally then, uh, the, uh, the regents at their meeting in Wichita, uh, they were on site in Wichita this, this month, uh, had a dialogue or an initial discussion on, on a weapons policy draft that, uh, that they had um, uh, disseminated. The, uh, there will be an additional <coughs> conversation and comment period uh, at the uh, December 
Board of Regents meeting. I think that originally there had been uh, the intent to adopt a policy at that meeting. Uh, I learned later today from just some updates uh, that, that occurred at the board meeting uh, in Wichita that the regions will probably adopt a policy in January. So I think they're going to push off their uh, decision process until the first month of the year. And so I just offer that as you uh, think about your conversation a little bit later today. Mr. Chairman, I would um, stop there and see if there are any questions. Questions of the board? I have one. Okay, go ahead, Lee. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Carter, didn't the governor and the administration change the, the model in which we calculate the budget revenue estimates? The, um, the, I don't know that there was any formal process. However, I think at the what we are doing now is historically the, uh, the month end reports used to be reported on the 30th or the 31st, the last day of the month. We're now doing that on the, the first or second uh, day of the new month and you're allowed to capture other accounts, fee funded agencies, interest, things like that. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Hmm? President Sopcic. Uh, Dick, earlier you mentioned about a review of local governing bodies. Yes. Would that include community college governing bodies? Well, certainly they're listed in that five, six hundred number that, that is often talked about uh, by different groups. Um, I, I think that uh, that would not necessarily be the purview of that committee but I'm not suggesting that the conversation might not come up. I have a question on your, on page one of your report, you listed in bold that one of the sweeps that was, that has been suggested in the administration's memo was to use, to take 1.4 million from unused higher education scholarships to help plug the budget hole. Why did we have 1.4, I mean, we've got students out there that need money to go to higher, higher ed. Why do we have 1.4 million? Yeah, that's a around? fair question and one that I cannot answer immediately. And I'll look into that. Um, they, that would come from the comprehensive grant fund that sits at the Board of Regents. And that's the large pot of money where those, where those dollars would be. And, and I don't have a good answer as to why those would be considered unused or unencumbered. Is that the fund where the, the ratio of monies available to students at public higher education versus private higher education institutions was flipped so that a higher, the, the majority of the money was going to students going to private schools in Kansas? That, that is correct. Is that policy up for review? Or is it just that be part of the normal legislative process if they wanted to? I'm not aware that that policy is up for review. Okay. Um, the sales tax on services, did the committee, is this just the opening initial introduction or did they receive any inter in information about the impact of that on a border county like Johnson County, which is built on professional services, and if you tax them, they can move, my law office can move two miles east and not be charged, not pay the tax, and it would have no choice really but to do so. Did they look at that yet, or is that a, a data point for the future? No, they, they did begin to look at that, and they looked at spreadsheets that contained the list of, of exemptions, uh, some of which those were included. Uh, the, numbers, the numbers fluctuate and are high, and that is where you find some of those dollars when you talk about services firms. I think the other one that is going to receive a lot of attention and, and has in, in the past couple of years, there's been low-level conversations, I think you're going to see that elevated. Uh, and, and that one in particular relates to sales tax on food, um, groceries purchased, not, not prepared food, but, but food at the grocery store. And I think you're going to see some, some conversation and some serious attempts to not only, once again, go in and lower that, but that means you're going to have to, to increase in other areas or, or, or remove exemptions from other areas. I remember, that's a really big number if you it eliminate it number. completely. It's a big number. Big number. All right. Thank you. Appreciate sure. you coming over and giving us that report. Uh, we we'll get to committee reports. The first one is the audit committee. Uh, the audit committee met on at eight o'clock on Thursday morning, November fifth. Uh, Trustee Sharp was present <coughs> with me, along with President Sopcich, and a list of who's who um, who takes care of our money and our careful policies on campus. We received. We have two action items tonight. Uh, these are found on pages one and one through four of the board packet. The first thing was a presentation of the, the audited financial statements for fiscal year 2015, ending June 30th, 2015. Uh, Mr. Lilly, a partner at Reuben Brown, our auditor, presented a draft annual financial statement report and the compliance report for that year. He informed the committee that the college had received an unmodified opinion, uh, which used to be called a, an unqualified opinion, which means it's okay. Everything's good. That's right. They found no, no discrepancies in material fashion that they needed to report. And so the committee made the following recommendation. 
Um, and I guess before I make the recommendation in the form of a motion, uh, I would be happy to try to answer any questions about our audit or Dr. Larson or Ms. Lears are here also to help with any of those specific questions. Anybody have any questions after their review of the packet? If not, it's a recommendation of the Audit Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the administration's recommendation to accept the audited financial statements for year ended June 30, 2015, and I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Passes unanimously. Our second uh, action item is on page two of the packet. It is the, relates to the Audit Committee's charter, our policies on what the Audit Committee is supposed to do. Um, and annually, the internal audit slash audit committee charter is reviewed as part of the board policies. Um, the practice is consistent with the Institute of Internal Auditors International Professional Practices Framework. Um, to periodically review the internal audit charter and present it to senior management and the board for approval. As a result of this review, the audit committee proposes updates to the reference to, to reference the current title of the audit committee as a reviewing committee for the annual external audit report. The, the changes are relatively minor and clerical on page three of your board packet. Uh, it is a recommendation of the audit committee that the board accept the recommendation of college administration to approve the proposed amendments to the external audit policy as shown subsequently in the board packet and I so moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or are there any questions about those changes? If not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries unanimously. The other items we reviewed, the audit, internal audit had, did an internal audit of our travel and expense uh, policy <coughs> and practices, uh, testing certain samples of, of travel expenses turned in by college employees. And the results of that review noted in general that reimbursements were found to be appropriate, necessary, and in compliance with our policies and procedures, uh, for which I thank uh, everybody that uses that, whether it's faculty, staff, or administration. It's nice to know that uh, folks are following our policies. We received quarterly project, project updates on various audits that are going on, that are ongoing on the campus. Uh, we, share, we received updates on the status of prior audit recommendations. We quarterly received reports on the JCC ethics report line, which is the report line for any kind of ethics or other complaints, which can be brought anonymously uh, on behalf of uh, an individual or on behalf of someone else. Uh, there were seven reports received between July 29th and October 23rd. Uh, two of those were received anonymously. None was entered by a staff member on behalf of another. And as of October 23rd, three reports have been reviewed and appropriately addressed, and four reports are currently in progress. Uh, Ms. Vogler also did uh, reviewed our quarterly report on the in behavioral intervention team, the BIT team, or and the COPS watch team um, to reflect how many uh, reports had been brought in and what had been done about those. Uh, she provided in-depth information on the approach being taken by the behavioral inter intervention team to provide support to members of the community. Finally, we received an executive briefing uh, from the JCCC Police Department and the internal audit on their audit of police department practices here at the college. Uh, Mr. McDade commended the police department, which was found to be effective, highly responsive to the needs of the campus community, and actively engaged in the continual improvement of its operation to respond to changing operational environments. And we talked somewhat about the various reporting requirements that the police department has under various federal and state uh, regulations. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions if anybody has any on those individual reports. If not, thank you. We will move on to the collegial steering report. Okay, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> collegial steering committee met at its regular monthly meeting a week ago Tuesday. And uh, we spent our hour talking about two things. First of all, we addressed the closing of the campus for the Royals World Series Victory Parade. Um, I know there was at least some concern on campus. I had at least one email from a faculty member wondering if this indicated a lack of commitment on our part to teaching and learning. Um, I responded I did not think it did. Uh, I know that the president and I were both uh, it's the president's call, and I, I'm not going to throw Joe under the bus, certainly, because I agreed with him on the ultimate decision. But both of us initially, our reaction was, we should not close Johnson County Community College because the Royals won the World Series. As it became clear that many members of our staff and faculty administration wanted to attend, and their children were being let out of K-12 through schools everywhere in the metropolitan area, 
and Metropolitan Community College had closed, and Kansas City, Kansas Community College had closed, it became fairly obvious that we should uh, consider that, and the president decided to close the college, and that decision needs to be made fairly early so people can plan for the next day. As I saw the reports of 800,000 people along a parade route and at Union Station, I think we made the right decision. Uh, perhaps the two Scrooges up here underestimated the impact of a Royals World Series victory after 29, 30 years. So uh, we did discuss that because I think it's important that the campus community know. Dr. Larson in particular on weather, weather events and as we come into the snow season, trying to figure out what we do here, uh, both to ensure that we actually do teaching and learning here and also that we keep the campus safe and that um, our public works folks can get the campus parking lots and roads cleared if it's gonna snow, how much it's gonna snow the next day. All of those prediction things are not a perfect science. And so um, I applaud those who have to make those decisions and I would be very reluctant to second guess them and I hope the rest of the campus community might be reluctant as well. Um, lastly, we spent the bulk of the time on the topic of how we fulfill the first part of our mission which is to inspire learning and what types of practices might be out there that our faculty members on the committee particularly um, can share, could share with us as to how to inspire students, how to engage students so that they actually get involved in the campus community, take advantage of all the things we have to offer. And we am particularly thankful for, for Professor uh, Brian Wright who shared with us the Model UN uh, method which really does get students uh, highly involved and engaged in a particular project that is interdisciplinary in, in function. So I'm sure we will continue that discussion um, into the future. Dr. Sopcich, anything add to add about collegial steering? No, I'm still thinking about your comment about throwing me under the bus. <laughs> I, I think I said I wouldn't throw you under okay. the bus. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This time. Human resources, Dr. Drummond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm pleased to report that our next meeting is December 9th, and we did not have a meeting this month. We'll have an end of the semester meeting next month. Okay. Thank you, sir. Learning Quality, Trustee Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Learning Quality Committee met uh, the day the Royals won the World Series, <laughs> uh, November 2nd, 2015. <laughs> Since it went after midnight. Uh, there was two different reports on sabbaticals from uh, Professor Sean Daly and Professor Sherry Liker both having wonderful reports of their uh, experiences on sabbaticals. Dr. Dennis Arjo uh, gave a presentation and brought forward uh, curriculum items uh, to be approved by the Learning Quality Committee. The curriculum changes include a lengthy list of course deactivations due to expectations of cable where the courses uh, have been, that have not been offered for four years at the LMA. Other modifications to courses included prerequisite changes and edits to clean up the catalog, the changes presented will be sent to the full board for approval and can be seen subsequently in the consent agenda the portion of this board packet. Uh, there was a presentation on the facilities use agreement by Bill Wegman. Bill presented a new facilities use agreement that will allow use of portions of Flex Steel's property as well as a training center in the logistic park in Edgerton, Kansas to support the commercial driver's license program. There, were, there will be no money exchange, no real fees charged to train at that facility. Dr. Andy Anderson attended an open house at the facility last week and said that he believes the interim site would provide opportunities not only for community education but also for the instructional branch. And finally, uh, Mr. Anderson also uh, presented the academic calendar, the 2018-19 year for approval, somewhat ahead of time. Understand. The calendar was reviewed and discussed, and we'll move forward for full board approval. Uh, specifically, as directed by the memorandum agreement between the Faculty Association and the Board of Trustees, the calendar committee is formed and is recommending the academic calendar for the 2018-19 year. And we are in 2015, right? And we are going to do it for three years now. That's great. <laughs> this calendar shell is recommended to be approved to allow the advanced plan of the curriculum development, administrative coordination for state and federal legislation. Some dates may be revisited due to contract negotiation, where some district schedule adjustments or curriculum changes. So therefore, uh, the Learning Quality Committee, Mr. Chair, recommends uh, that the college administration and faculty association, that it is the recommendation of the college administration and faculty association. The Board of Trustees approved the 2018 
19 academic calendar as shown on the following pages. Uh, so. Good, moved and seconded to adopt the uh, academic calendar for 2018-2019 by coincidence our 50th anniversary year as a college. Is there any discussion? Questions? If not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chair, uh, that concludes my report for the Learning Quality Committee on the day that the Royals won the World Series. <laughs> I'm surprised that you didn't in include a day off in the 2018-2019 calendar for the World Series Parade. Well, and just so uh, the, the general public knows, I had a, I think we each had a chance to meet with Dr. Sobchik over the last couple of weeks, and uh, Dr. Sobchik, as he briefed me, you know, S Dr. Sobchik is a learned scholar. I think he went to some random undergraduate institution, what was it? <laughs> Notre Dame. That's right. A serious school of learning, and has his PhD, and he, he did not want to close the school, and frankly, it was late in the day after 3 o'clock, after 4 o'clock, when we finally made the call. Oh, we made that call pretty early. We made that call about, about 2 o'clock, I think, was it? <laughs> but once it was, I mean, I know with the child in the Shawnee Mission School District that there was talk pretty early on Monday that we were going to close. So you guys waited as long as you could right. until we really had no option but to close. Same way Ned, Yo Ned Yost handles his pitching staff. <laughs> we as as we could. Yeah. So All I just right. wanted to say... <laughs> Long-windedly, I agreed with the closure and uh, support the administration on that. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I started that tangent. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot blame anybody but myself. Uh, next item is the Management Committee agenda, Dr. Cook, or or Management Committee report, Dr. Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The uh, Management Committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, November 4th. Trustees Lindstrom and Cross were in attendance at that meeting, along with all the support staff of the administration. Uh, we have three recommendations to present this evening. Uh, the first, as you see in your packet, is not an old item uh, as a result of a couple of board retreats and as a, couple, as a result of our August 13th uh, meeting uh, where this board adopted a resolution authorizing the sale of $9.8 million in general obligation capital outlay bonds to fund various camp campus infrastructure projects. Uh, we have a recommendation for that amendment. Uh, in, re in relationship to that issue, the planned date of the bond sale is December 17th. Accordingly, the college's fiscal year 2015-16 budget must be amended in order to provide for the bond sale and related expenditures in the approximate amount of $9.8 million. In addition, at the September and October management committee meetings, college administration discussed the plan. Just lost my page. Um, planned use of the general fund reserves to fund approximately $1.7 million in renovation to the Carlson Center. The college's fiscal year 2015-16 budget must be amended in order to fund these additional expenditures. And again, the $9.8 million and the one point seven renovation is a result of uh, several discussions we've had at board retreats about updating and, and making sure the renovation of our campus is in order. Uh, the budget hearing will be held on December 17th. Upon approval by the Board of Trustees, the amended budget will be filed with the county clerk and the state accordingly. So it is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to amend the College's fiscal 2015-16 budget as previously described and to authorize the publication of the Notice of Public Hearing for amending the 2016 budget, and I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, to publish notice and hold a hearing then in, on December 17th for an amendment to the budget. Is there any discussion or are there any questions? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carried unanimously. There are two recommendations based on bids for, for requests for proposals. The first was a bid for the annual contract for printing the continuing education catalogs for spring 2016, summer 2016, and fall 2016 terms, so we submit the following recommendation. Uh, it is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the low bid of $174,900 from Henry Wurst, Inc. for an annual contract for printing of the continuing education catalogs, and I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the recommendation of the low bid of Henry Wurst, Inc. for annual contract for printing. Is there any Discussion, are there any questions? I might add, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, as our regular process, staff goes through a, a, a really uh, deep evaluation of the proposals. Uh, we discussed all of the proposals that were made, and uh, this recommendation is, is the best for the college. 
I noted seven firms were notified, five uh, responded with a bid, and this is a low bid. Okay. That's correct. No other questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries unanimously. Next recommendation is an RFP to establish a contract for a facilities master plan. Again, I would remind this board that we discussed uh, the, um, the interest in a master plan at, at our board retreat in April and even prior to that. Um, we really haven't done an extensive master plan. Uh, we did have discussion in 2010, and it was the recommendation at that time uh, to, uh, to conduct a facilities master plan. Uh, Jim Free, Director of Facility Planning, on that date, February 22nd, in 2010, outlined the need for a master facilities plan. And uh, so uh, with, with that kind of initiative in 2010 and with the discussion at our board retreat, uh, we're at the point to uh, take action on an RFP. Before we do that, though, I'd like to, to ask Rex Hayes and Barbara Larson to come to the podium. Uh, I, th I think it's worthy for this board uh, it's, we, we saw a detailed uh, report at the Management Committee, but I think also for this board and the public when we're uh, about to engage on a facilities plan to go over some of the points. So Rex and Barbara, if you would, please. Uh, these slides that we're going to show you are from the Smith Group uh, proposal presentation. Barbara and I are going to go through them quickly. but. Uh, and I just want to remind everybody that the timeline to have this facilities master plan completed is uh, June of 2016, so next year. And so based on discussions with the, the board, uh, two retreats focus on facilities issues. We agreed to proceed with an RFP for a facility master planning services. So why a master plan? Well, a master plan is beneficial in uh, many ways, but there's a special uh, value in that we will use our strategic and academic priorities as well as data to uh, plan our facilities for the future. So the Smith Group, they rank the highest for the evaluation team based on their experience and approach and especially working with community colleges. And another benefit, uh, they, uh, they added two team members that are a great value, Pauline and Associates, they're well-known academic planners. And then we, they also partner with HMN, or an architectural firm, that have, they've been with the college since 1980, so they know our campus as well as anybody in the, in, that's done any work. <coughs> so on this, this slide shows there are 54 community colleges uh, listed, and this shows that there's a strong national experience along with geographic. Uh, again, this slide highlights the Smith Group experience with community colleges and the League for Innovation, Innovation colleagues, which are our peers. So this is one of the community college master plans that the Smith Group discussed, Metropolitan Community College in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, and this slide here uh, tells a little bit more about Metropolitan Community College, but one of the reference calls that we made uh, was to their EVP for finance and administrative services. And he had high praise for the Smith Group. You know, they were so pleased with them that they added them to their on-call professional uh, services. So some of the comments that they made were that they were great communicators, they were very knowledgeable, and met uh, the agreed upon schedule and budget. This slide shows how the Smith Group brought in data on, a regional, on regional demographics and on the projected growth in academic programs. Again, this slide demonstrates uh, another part of the planning process, how they use planning to reuse buildings to meet their future needs. And this slide shows how they use planning to help the campus prioritize and prepare cost estimates for the plan. And, you know, through these processes, this allowed uh, Metropolitan Community College to create the basis for the largest capital campaign in the college's history. And this slide shows one scenario of renovating spaces and shifting program locations to better serve their needs. 
Thanks, Rex. The um, evaluation committee was impressed with the homework that the Smith Group did in preparation for their <laughs> submission. Um, we've talked a lot about facilities uh, with the board in the last year, particularly as Dr. Cook mentioned. We now support over 1.5 million square feet of building space, 1.8 million square feet when you add our parking structures. The average cost of operating our buildings is about $9 a square foot, and that includes utilities, uh, housekeeping, maintain maintenance costs, as well as securing those buildings. So if we were to add, for instance, a 40,000 square foot building to the campus, we'd be looking at ongoing costs of $360,000 annually just to open the doors. And so that's why we're really uh, focusing on this plan to look more strategically at our campus. And again, I'm sure with a lot of help from HMN, uh, this, uh, this pre-work we were uh, very impressed with. So uh, this is just building use, looking at our campus in terms of buildings that are primarily academic. You see those in the kind of blue uh, color, uh, primarily classroom buildings, and then the student life, student support buildings uh, shown there, um, as well as buildings that are um, exclusively uh, administrative or support buildings. From an academic program and spatial relationships um, standpoint, one of the one of the uh, deliverables that we will receive out of this master planning with a lot of input from uh, many people here in this room is about what makes sense in terms of where our programs are located, what, are, what is best for um, our students in terms of their educational experience. And so just one example, and I know it's difficult to see, but you'll see the, oh, it looks somewhat gold here where you have art and design. It's the second art and design, and you'll see that, well, we have art and design functions in the Nerman, um, and then really across the campus in the ATB building, and then we teach our graphic um, design program on the third floor of the library. So that's just <coughs> one example of how we have um, similar programs but spread across, across the campus. Uh, this is building age. I thought this was a much more effective way to demonstrate building age than the bar graphs that we've been showing you for the last year. At, uh, not surprisingly, you see our oldest building in the core of the campus, oldest buildings at the campus's core, and then you see the ring of buildings added as um, the decades progressed as we've made decisions about adding to our campus. And finally, circulation and wayfinding. Another deliverable from a master plan is how does it make sense for people to make their way around the campus, both from a pedestrian standpoint as well as driving? How, to, how do new um, visitors to our campus find their way uh, around? And so um, real important um, information, and, and we're excited about the uh, potential that we will have. And so, um, again, we were very impressed with the proposal from the Smith Group, their um, extensive background, especially working with community colleges, um, and uh, look forward to the process. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both, uh, Rex and Barbara. Uh, I would remind the board again that Dr. Sopcich charged us with what are we, uh, we've just, we're just about ready to experience <coughs> 50 years of life <coughs> as a campus, and, and what are we going to look like in the next 50 years? So as Rex and Barbara have lined out, we have uh, the traditional uh, analysis of infrastructure and of space utilization, uh, but at least to me uh, personally, what's excited about uh, the Smith Group and the partnerships they've made is this, this coalition with the academic analysis. We are about teaching and learning, so uh, I'm really hopeful and expecting that we'll g g receive really good data about how effectively we're utilizing the space we have to assist our student population of all ages in the teaching and learning process. And so with that, uh, it is the recommendation of the College Administration that the Board of <coughs> Trustees approve the proposal from Smith Group JJR for a facilities master plan for a total expenditure not to exceed $208,945, and I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any board members have any questions? I wondered if, when, when was the Omaha Metropolitan Community College uh, study done? I guess my question is, did these guys speak to what we've talked about is with the way, with online learning and other things, we may not be building any new buildings, but we may be using buildings differently. Have they done that on campuses recently? Yes. That's part of their expertise. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think, again, it, 
I know that's hard to see, but one of the slides in uh, that portion talked about reusing space, and um, so yes, that is certainly part of it. Now they have also um, have a capital campaign that I think grew out of their planning, but and I, I believe it was several years ago that they several completed. years ago. They're pretty much wrapping up the campaign. That was a forty-five million dollar campaign that they concluded successfully in Omaha. Now keep in mind also that's a six-county area that they're mm -hmm. responsible for. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor? Uh, yes, Trustee Cross. Quick, I've asked the question a couple of times, and just to let you know I'm not too far out in left field. I've represented a few different environmental groups in my travels, and with respect to operable windows, I found a uh, website for a program related to the city of Boston, and they discuss that operable windows can not only provide a greater degree of control and comfort in buildings, but it can help reduce costs considerably. So it is, it is a discussion in the environmental movement and within, I think, the concept of sustainability, uh, particularly on a campus with the age of our buildings and, uh, frankly, most if not all of our buildings that don't have operable windows. Uh, I'm really raising this as a comment. I don't mean to bloviate or take too much time here on it. I'm just challenging the board to consider items such as this because as we do look at what we need to maintain our, our campus, I think that this is something we should consider. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The motion carries unanimously. The management committee also received reports from staff. Uh, this included the annual foundation report from Kate Allen. Uh, Trustee Ingram will be speaking a little bit more about the foundation uh, in her report, uh, but uh, I would re reinforce again, we cannot reinforce it enough. The foundation provided over a million dollars in scholarships to students over the past year. and. Uh, uh, she gave a very detailed report about the activities of the foundation. Dr. Jay Antel provided uh, a report on campus energy usage. For those of you that have been on the board for some time, you know we've taken action over the years to uh, uh, become more efficient in our energy usage. Uh, that program is called Power Switch. Uh, Dr. Antel highlighted initiatives undertaken to reduce electricity usage. He stated that our annual electricity usage is down 18% since 2008, even while adding net square footage to the campus. And that has been achieved while electricity rates have increased an average of 8% each year since then. And if you've been following the news, we're, uh, we're due to probably have another uh, uh, electric uh, rate uh, by our provider. And so I think our efforts that we've done to <coughs> conserve energy has been very effective. I would point out that part of that 18% is a result of the campus uh, closing a 24-hour shift uh, a, a, a strategy. Uh, so that, that has helped with that 18% reduction. Rachel Lears provided a quarterly update on college investments in the Kansas Municipal Investment Pool. She also gave an assess valuation update and provided a review of the five-year budget projection model. Mitch Borchers presented the sole source report as well as a summary of bids between 25000 and $100,000, and that summary can be found on page 16 of your board packet. Uh, Rex Hayes provided a monthly update on capital infrastructure projects, and his report is on page 22 of that packet. And uh, I, as I recall, most of our projects are on, on uh, time and uh, on budget, and so we're very pleased about that. Um, I have distributed one other item that really isn't part of the management report, uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to... Uh, imply a political statement, but in today's Kansas City Star under the Bloomberg Review, uh, the Bloomberg Review pointed out that in the Republican debates, and specifically uh, Marco Rubio talked about the importance of technical training and welding. And I know that part of our master plan is to look at our technical services. And I, I just appreciate that at the national level, and by the way, uh, that's also a main topic of discussion at ACCT on our technical school and our vocational training, and our time is now to help these students uh, become employable. So uh, I thought that was very interesting that uh, while it wasn't a big item on the national scene, it's becoming uh, discussed more fluently. So, Mr. Chair, thank you for, for your time. Any other questions about the management committee? If not, um, I will give the treasurer's report in absence of Mr. Lindstrom. Uh, the board packet includes the treasurer's report for the month ended September 30th. Uh, it, it begins at page 24 of the board packet. <coughs> uh, 
Page one of the treasurer's report is the general post-secondary technical <coughs> education funds. Summary, uh, September 30th re represents the end of the college's first fiscal quarter, so 25% of the year has passed. We received a, a property tax, ad valorem tax distribution of $4,292,011 from the county treasurer during September, and it was distributed to the general fund, the capital outlay fund, and the special assessment fund. Um, an ad valorem tax distribution of $1,209,978 was received in October and will be reflected in next month's report. The college's unencumbered cash balance as of September 30th in all funds was $78.9 million, approximately $7.4 million higher than last year at the same time. And the expenditures within the primary operating funds are within approved budgetary limits. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to help you direct them to Dr. Larson or Mr. Lears, Ms. Lears, Mr. Lears. I'm sorry, Rachel. <coughs> um, otherwise, it is a recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the treasurer's report for the month of September 30, 2015, subject to audit. And I'd so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries unanimously. We are ready for the president's monthly report to the board. Thank you, Trustee Musil. Um, first of all, you've received the monthly report to the, to the board. It's about 28 pages of, of fantastic uh, updates and insights into what's going on on campus. It's really an excellent report this month. Uh, so I hope you've had the chance to read that. Uh, and we're now going to launch into a new and expanded version of the lightning round. So, yes. So, Dr. Korb, can you kick it, away, kick it off? Okay. Well, I have to read mine tonight so that I make sure that I get this right. But, and I believe that part of this, if not all, might be in your report, but I'm going to read this to you because I want to highlight it. Dr. Um, Anthony Finari, who is our Johnson County Community College grants professional, presented on building and sustaining partnerships at a U.S.-Pakistan University partnership workshop sponsored by World Learning on behalf of the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Embassy in Pakistan. The workshop was held in October 26 through 29 in Washington, D.C., with approximately 30 institutions of higher education in attendance. Johnson County Community College was the only community college invited to attend and present at the event. All expenses to the travel for this event were paid for by World Learning. Dr. Fenari presented information on the Johnson County Community College partnership with Sucker Institute of Business Administration. This relationship started with a grant in 2013 from the U.S. Department of State, and it was spearheaded by Andy Anderson, our Vice President of Instruction, and managed by Dr. Tom Patterson, who is our Director of International Education. The goal of the project was to replicate community <coughs> college, the community college model in Pakistan with the initial focus being on students with developmental needs and implementing effective support services to help these students achieve academic success. So I wanted to highlight it because we were honored, first of all, to be invited to give a presentation and um, very happy to have Dr. Finari represent us there. <coughs> it's terrific. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Dr. Larson. Well, thank you. Tonight I'm happy to talk about trash, not trash talk. <laughs> I'm talking about trash or the lack of it. Dr. Antle and the Center for S Sustainability recently announced an important milestone. For the fiscal year just ended, we recycled more as a college than we sent to landfills. In other words, our recycling tonnage now exceeds our trash tonnage. Annual trash disposal expenses are down $28,000 compared to what they were in 2010-11. Our recycling tonnage has more than tripled over the same period. The students who help make this possible are gaining valuable experiences in their internship roles. And this is really a team effort across the institution led by Michael Ray and Crystal Anton in sustainability, the warehouse staff, our open pedal farm crew, and housekeeping. They all deserve credit in helping to divert waste from landfills by their ongoing commitment to our recycling program. Terrific. Thank you, Barbara. Mr. Anderson. And I need to be brief. <laughs> I will. Hopefully. Okay. Anyway, uh, I, I, as we come to the end of this semester, I wanted to call attention to a new program. It grew out of our strategic planning and AQIP project to develop a winter session. Uh, we are offering six courses uh, this coming period between the spring and the fall and spring semester. 
Uh, we originally were trying to plan how we were going to advertise and promote these courses. Uh, the six courses are, are already full. Well, two of them are still have some open seats. Four of them are already full. We have, they're all in uh, general education courses that are transferable, which will help students uh, reach their goals more quickly. Uh, we have a course in biology, environmental science, uh, economics, uh, physical geography, U.S. history since 1877, that, that course is full. Mass media and society, journalism is full. Uh, Psychology 130 is full. Uh, so those six courses have already uh, been, um, are very successful. Uh, it's, it's a new um, activity. Well, I say new, actually way back when the college uh, began, we actually did have interim uh, sections that we had, had discontinued. Uh, so in a sense, what we're doing is bringing back and, and uh, providing this in a new way. Uh, and it's a program I'm sure will continue to grow. These courses are all being offered online uh, so that they uh, won't, the, the, the students will be able to perform for the few days that the college is actually closed, uh, but they will kick off before, uh, before school is closed for the winter break, and uh, we're, we're excited about this. So, thank you. That's great, Andy. That's great. Okay, Dr. Weber. All right, I want to just, I don't know if it's on. I'm going to go ahead and go. Um, I uh, wanted to make you aware, if you're looking at a lot of national news, you're hopefully getting caught, catching wind of the Pathways project that's going on uh, across most community colleges. We currently have a Pathways project going on at the college, and it, ours kind of culminated from a lot of our strategic planning initiatives, uh, the, the recommendations that came forward didn't necessarily look at the singular student lens and so this is kind of that next step to look at it and say how is a single student experience going to be occurred. Uh, we have three teams that have and it are started in the spring. They did a lot of work through the summer. They continue to do a lot of work. But our primary things we're looking are is student entry. So how do we make sure that a student is first day ready? Um, the current student group, so and primarily the first the current student group is looking at first semester experience and we'll expand from there, but that's our first tackle. And then thirdly, we have an ed, ed, uh, technology group, and the technology group is looking at what are the resources we're using across the campus and that our students interacting to make sure that they have the best experience possible. A lot of good traction. We've got about 24 people on the committee, 11 faculty, two staff, and two administrators. Uh, I, I, I guess I want to bring a to kind of bring a full circle on this, and maybe Ron can speak to it when, when, when he reports. Uh, staff development is part of a cooperation with uh, Iowa Community Colleges. Had a Community College Leadership Institute actually yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so Kay McClenney was on campus today, along with Gretchen Schmidt, who is leading this Pathways Initiative for AACC. And it was really interesting because the, the book that we're, our group is using is Redesigning America's <laughs> Community Colleges and it's out of the Community College Research Center. And so we have, we've been using a lot of the common language as part of our, our team doing this. And so hearing Kay McClenney and Gretchen Smith tell these stories today, I saw a lot of JCCC heads bobbing because these were things that we'd already been talking about in our group. So a lot of positive momentum. This year primarily will be foundational work, so there won't be a lot of, um, of things for people to see, feel, or touch. But I think we're building a really strong foundation for student success. Thanks. Hey, Randy. Um, I got a question. Um, ultimately, how does the student benefit from the pathways? The way students will benefit is we're going to have a more intentional student experience. So I've got a sign on my thing that says each student's success is accounted for. And so we need to make sure that we know students' goals and we've got a plan for them to attain it. So that's, in a nutshell, what's a student's goal? What's our plan for them to achieve it? That's great. Thanks, Randy. Ms. Martley. <coughs> Trusty Cross mentioned the LCC report that we had the other day, and so these are brand new print marketing that I thought I'd bring tonight to share. Sure, would you, I, you, would you identify a, yourself? We probably ought to do that each time so that people are watching on TV know who you are. And I'm sorry, I just okay. thought about it with you. I'm a little slow, but. Okay. Hi, I'm Karen Martley. I'm the Associate Vice President of Continuing Education and Organizational Development. Thank you. 
So this is some of our print marketing that I wanted to share that the EDCs are putting in their packets as they recruit new companies to the area that has a listing of the classes that are happening in December and then beginning in 2016 at the, at the logistics park. Um, so I, I wanted to share that as you, if you open it up, you will first see the technical classes, which are the CDL and the warehousing logistic classes. What is uh, great about that is some of the donations we've had, which are the driving range, the forklift. They've also helped us with trainers out there and provided, donated the, the racks that we're using for the forklift training. <clears throat> That has morphed into some soft skills training. You will see that listing. So we've reduced the, the length of those classes and made them at a price point that we got from those customers in the area and the EDCs and all the partners going out and collecting some data. So we're, we're also going to offer those as well as taking calls about GED classes. And if the interest is there, we'll start doing the GED classes out there as well. Um, what we're really pleased about, not only on this print side of the marketing, is that all of those partners listed inside are doing a tremendous amount of social media marketing for us. And that, that what we've already seen is a lot of interest in the automation engineering technology classes. And Richard Ford has been invaluable going out and or talking to those clients about the credit programming. We've also had requests from a manufacturing network that we're now doing a three-tiered leadership program for them as well as uh, now we're getting requests some about the new security IT that will be happening in credit because of the secure site there around the BNSF side of the intermodal. So, so if you have any questions about any of the program we're doing in the classroom, please let me know. Or if you hear about needs on other topics, please let us know. We'd be glad to uh, address those with those clients. Do you have any questions? I would just note in my typical obsessive fashion, CDL is Commercial driver's license. Commercial driver's license. So when you mentioned driving range, it's driving of semi-tractors and trailers. Yes. And the EDC partners we work with are economic development councils of various chambers around the, count, the, the county. Yes. I also noticed, I think it's important, the partners that are listed on here are the Logistics Park Kansas City, BNSF Railway, North Point Development, the Workforce Partnership of Johnson, Leavenworth, and Wyandotte County, City of Edgerton, Kansas, and the Southwest Johnson County uh, Economic Development Council, I believe, and I, I applaud you for those kind of partnerships. I think that's what our citizens ask us to do, and you're doing a great job on it at, at a new facility that will be really exciting for the county. Okay. I do want to mention there's an added partner now. The Miami Workforce Partnership has also joined the group, so that's bringing in a lot more of a southern presence for us. We're really seeing that now, too. That's good. Thank Thanks. you. Sure. That's terrific, Karen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Just a few things, and I think this is representative of a lot of very exciting um, events and programs that are happening on our campus. Um, I'd like to share with you a few more. Many of you were at Some Enchanted Evening over the weekend. We've talked about the $533,000 that was raised and the 560 people that were there. Um, but what made this event, um, I think, heads and tails above previous ones uh, was the student involvement that we had. Um, for example, when you started the evening there, we had about 15 students from our hospitality and culinary program that were serving hors d'oeuvres. They were all decked out in their Johnson County uh, jackets. Um, very well received by everyone there. Um, our honoree, Mary Davidson, uh, wore a, an outfit that was designed and actually made by a student in our fashion design program, Kimby Sweeney. Uh, that was a first. Um, the video that was shown was produced by Heather Foley, She's a student in our JCAB program. These are excellent opportunities for our students to shine. And lastly, our featured student speaker, Samantha Courtney, literally wowed the crowd with her stories of personal accomplishment and achievement um, over some pretty significant adversity in her life. So we always talk about the money and we always talk about the, the, the event itself, but what really mattered this time uh, was the role that our students played. And, I, and we're so proud, uh, and I think you would agree, that they represented the college very, very well. Here's another example of something that, that's uh, kind of remarkable that's going on on campus. Uh, this is called Saturday STEM Academy. We host a Saturday STEM Academy, and uh, naturally it's on, the emphasis is on science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, students from Wyandotte High School and the junior high, Wyandotte Junior High Middle Schools, uh, come to our college on Saturdays 
and they do a variety of projects. Now, this is over 200, sat 200 students over a period of four Saturdays. Um, they get hands-on activities with our stormwater project, which of course touches biodiversity and water quality. They get to learn about our solar and thermal facilities that we have, and they also get involved in our farm and compost shed. And what's great about this is that this is driven by um, quite an array of our faculty and, and staff here on campus. Uh, first of all, Deb Williams is the lead on this. She, of course, is in the science area. Christy Howell is in sustainability. And then others that are involved are Dean Eberly, Rebecca Lane, uh, Lonnie Whittiers, Crystal Anton, and we even have a student intern, Emily uh, Reno. Um, this project is really important as STEM is critical but also the outreach to the community has been, I think, fantastic. Um, the KU Med Center is one of the sponsors, as well as our own foundation, all on our campus. And lastly, lastly on Sunday, um, our Phi Theta Kappa, Kappa uh, chapter inducted 93 new members, 93 new members. Um, and I have to say the student leadership was in very, very impressive. Um, Sean Huggins as president, and they have four VPs, uh, Joshua Friedenhammer, Reagan Lewis, Mackenzie Lewis, and Xiao Xiao Li, and Alyssa Gatewood uh, did a fantastic job at the podium in managing that whole ceremony. Um, I also have to say that uh, what's really impressive are the, are the advisors in this, Anna Page and Lindsay Welch, who, Welch, who really stepped in, um, and, and there's kind of a challenge as there's a whole new team it's a whole new team, and they've taken this program on, and what was uh, great was the enthusiasm the students have. They're excited about what they can do this year with our PTK, with our PTK chapter. So I guess when you look at all this and everything that was said tonight in the lightning round, um, you know, we have so many successful students here doing incredible things, but a big factor behind that are the faculty and the staff who are right there with them making this stuff happen. And that's what makes this college so special. So that concludes my report for tonight. Thank you. You left out of your report on the Summit Janet Evening the uh, custodian mother that you interviewed on the stage who has worked very hard to put four children through Johnson County Community College and then through four-year colleges and <laughs> medical school and pharmacy. engineering school and other and pharmacy school. And that was also very impressive about somebody who, who came from Ethiopia, I believe, and, and has built a very great life here and turned four talented uh, children out into the world uh, to help us, so. Well, and that's, you know, as our mission is to inspire learning, and every one of these cases, they are inspired by the people they encounter here in the classroom and also in our services to help them succeed. And I, I know that the budget is tight, but I wanna show you what our president will not even refill his toner, print something off for the meeting. And his, that's why he was having so much trouble reading it. We'll get you a new toner cartridge, Mr. President. Thank you, Trustee Chair. <laughs> I can't read it. Um, have any old business and, or new business? Chair, if I may, yes. I have a, just a follow up on Dr. Larson's uh, Certainly. exciting discussion of trash. Mm -hmm. More from the we did everything we could before we asked more money department. Um, how much did we reduce our trash usage in, in the report that you gave? $28,000 in terms of, go ahead. you mean in tonnage? Yes. Do we, you know, I have that, but not with me. I can certainly provide it. I raised the issue because about a month ago, I got, two weeks ago, I got an email from the Harvard Divinity School in which they conducted a trash audit. Yes. I didn't I, know that. Apparently, they have so many people mm. in the time of the East, they do trash audits. <laughs> so they reduced their trash at the Harvard Divinity School by over 90% over 10 years wow. through basic things, many of which I think we're doing, but I'm just challenging the administration and our students to continue the good work. And uh, I, I'll send you the link so you good, can follow, thank you. I, I can follow up. But I wanted to commend us and then just say, this is also out there. Good, thank you. Is, is Jay here? I didn't see Jay tonight. I don't think Jay's made it because he, would, he will jump all over that, mm -hmm. Trustee Cross, if he gets the opportunity. Um, <laughs> and I won't be able to print my agenda anymore. I'll have to do it online. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, report from the Faculty Association. Mr. Polchik, would you favor us with a report from the Faculty Association? Thank you. Uh, good evening, 
uh, Chairman Musil, uh, the Board of Trustees, Dr. Sobchak, uh, and the other members of Dr. Sobchak's team. I would like to introduce uh, Brian Wright. Uh, he's in the audience. Uh, he's the Vice President of the Faculty Association. I just wanted to make sure that we had that note. Give a wave. Thank you. And uh, we're in our 14th week of the semester of a typical 16-week uh, semester. We're winding down with only eight days of school remaining. Tomorrow, two days next week, then Thanksgiving break, followed by five straight days, and then final exams start on Monday, December 7th. Wow. Uh, Andy, you stole part of my speech. I'm really <laughs> angry at you. Again, I want to remind you of the new trial run of the winter terms project. <laughs> and we're looking into idea. offering, maybe it would be good to do it again. Looking into offering the course during winter break, uh, the start dates will be Monday, December 12th. I don't know if you added that. Finishing on Saturday, January 9th. The six courses being offered this winter are as follows. Biology, 130. There's three seats left. I just checked. So if you're out there and you need biology, get in there. Economics, physical geography. There's seven seats left. Hurry. Well, maybe there's less now. And then, of course, U.S. History is full, journalism, medium, communications, and the speaker of this, the teacher of the course is sitting right here, Molly. Wave, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> and Psychology 130. Uh, but I do want to remind people out there that uh, if you're interested in any of these courses, and even if they're full, do check daily on our website, because sometimes students move in and move out, and jump in, grab it, um, and go from there. Uh, we have a lot of things going. I'm doing a lightning round as myself. Uh, program review is ongoing, year in, year out, here at the college, trying to improve our college at all times. Uh, and every three years, every department goes through a thorough one. But every year we do a little bit, and we're doing it now. We're looking for successes, we're looking for improvement, we're looking for changes, anything and everything that we can do to help our students. The college is uh, preparing for the Higher Learning Commission visit, the College Accreditation, within two years. They should be, here, excuse me, he should be here either the fall of 2017 or the spring of 2018. And this is a campus-wide endeavor from our board to our president to our vice presidents, all the way down to us lowly faculty members and staff. And we want to make sure we're successful. In the wake of the Oregon Community College shooting last month, the faculty held the first of two townhouse meetings, and I'll have to change that because we've now decided it's going to be more than two. Uh, between three faculty groups, the Faculty Association, the Faculty Senate, and Ed Affairs. And that meeting was on Friday, November the 13th. And incidentally, while this meeting was taking place, the attack in Paris was happening at the same time. The faculty, the staff, and students, uh, plus two board members who were present, Trustee uh, Stephanie Sharp, who's not here right now, and uh, we also had Stephanie, you know, trustee, and uh, we're sharing concerns and opinions, et cetera, to illustrate the benefits. There's a plan to have perhaps a survey of the faculty before our, needs, our next meeting of the uh, townhouse meeting. We're going to try to do that. One of the things I would talk to Joe Sopchek about was uh, talking about some of the innovations on our campus. And I wanted to talk about something dear to my heart. We have something called a math contest. Yeah, there's an association of mathematics teachers, we call it AMATIC, American Mathematics Association of two-year colleges. These are community college math organization. Uh, we have a math contest that we hold every year. And I even have it color-coded. So I'll give that to you, Joe. And the competition consists of two one-hour exams. They're given in the fall and they're given in the spring. Students may take one or both of the exams. The total of the top five scores at the JCC team scores participations. Participants can complete the, uh, compete for prizes in organization and recognition is, wait a minute, I'm gonna try that again. Participants can compete for prizes and recognition as individuals and as a JCCC team. Each contestant exam consists of 20 questions. All questions are at a pre-calculus level. Most graphing calculators may be used. A perfect score would be 40 points. And what they do is they give you two points for every correct answer. Uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't answer it, you get zero. But if you got it wrong, they take a half a point away. So it penalizes you for guessing. The score uh, is in the teens are very good. So that means you get 19, 18, 17. You did very well out of a total of 40. 
Uh, sample tests are available in the Math Resource Center we have on our campus in CLB 212. As you look over the sample tests, you should not expect to answer all the questions, especially in one hour. It is a timed exam. Nationally, the top prizes for this uh, highest total scores are both in both tests is a $3,000 scholarship that AMATIC does give. The JCCC first place winner for our students themselves, in each round we give them $50. We have budgeted that in the math department. Second place winners receive $25, and those awards will be doubled if their scores are 25 or higher, which we've doubled quite a bit. Also, students earning the highest composite scores for the two rounds will receive an additional $50. We've had some students walk off with $300 from us. It was great. Now, down to the nitty-gritty. What happens is we have regions throughout the whole country. Our region is considered the central region. It consists of Colorado, Idaho, uh, wait a minute, Iowa, not Idaho, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, uh, we have Nebraska, and we have North Dakota. That's our region. Our biggest competition for us at Johnson County Community College is the St. Louis Community Colleges and the St. Paul uh, Minneapolis Community Colleges. They're our biggest competition. But to give you an idea, uh, this has been going on since 1990. We, in 2001-2003, in we were the national champs. JCCC won it. I was honored. I was at the AMATI conference. I got to receive the award for the student. In hindsight, I would have said, let foundation should have paid for that lead student to go and receive that award. Mm. I didn't know that. Now I do. So if we win it again, I'm going to hit up foundation to send them. <laughs> we were third nationally twice in 1991 and 1992. Pardon? Oh. Okay. Sorry. It must be echo. 1991, 1992, 1990, and 1991. We were fifth in 1992 and 1993. We also, in our region, we finished first of those schools I mentioned eight times. We were second four times. We were fourth, uh, third four times. And JCC placed at least fifth every year since it started, never less than five. And we have quite a few community colleges in our region. And that's my uh, final report about that. I want to thank uh, uh, Ch uh, Chairman Musil and a good night. And I do want to add a PS, but Dave Lindstrom's not here. I just wanted to be sure to ask him how his Thanksgiving dinner went yesterday here at the college. Okay. Any questions for me? Questions for Mr. Polchik? Just, just briefly, Please? Mr. Polchik, did you, was it me that attended that meeting with Trustee Sharp or was it Trustee Ingram? It was Trustee Ingram. Thank Trustee you very Ingram. much. Yes. Trustee Ingram. I need a clarification. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Trustee Ingram and Trustee Sharp were there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I want to thank the faculty again for its interest in the campus security issues. And I'm looking at Chief Russell behind you because he's been, he and his force have been very active in attending a lot of meetings to try to, to get input and to help us uh, continue uh, the high level of safety and security here. We really appreciate you guys are on the front lines and you see things and an uh, integral part of the team. So thank you very much for your report. Um, good luck as you go through finals. I'm sure by our next board meeting on the 17th, you'll have everything graded and all the grades out. Well, if, if not, I won't be here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brian, for attending too as vice president. All right, the next item on, on the agenda is uh, Johnson County Educational Research Triangle. That's uh, Trustee Lindstrom serves on the, the Johnson County Educational Research Triangle, which is a beneficiary of an eight cent sales tax passed in 2008. Um, Trustee Lindstrom gave me some information about the last meeting of the JSERT board, which was held on October 26th at the KU Edwards campus. Um, unlike the report that Mr. Carter gave us on statewide sales taxes, sales taxes in Johnson County continue to be strong. Um, for the month of October, uh, we took in $1.4 million in sales taxes out of the one eight cent, and the year before it was 1.38 million. So it was up about 2.7% uh, out of the last six months. It's been up every month except one. It was down 0.98% in June. Uh, September ended up being up 6.55% in total dollars over a year ago. So sales tax receipts in Johnson County continue to be strong and to continue to help fund the KU uh, Cancer Clinical Program, the KU Edwards Campus, and the K-State Innovation Campus in Olathe. If anybody has any questions about that, I probably won't be able to answer them, but I would 
certainly try. K-State has a campus in Olathe? Yes, K-State has a campus in Olathe. <laughs> yes. In there four or five years, right? It has. I'm going to be, I'm going to filter and not make any comments about that. <laughs> Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Dr. Cook. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the uh, KACCT has not met since our last meeting. Our next meeting is December 6th and 7th, Sunday and Monday at Allen County Community College. And um, so we'll be, uh, we'll be attending that quarterly meeting. If I, if I might, Mr. Chair, I would, I would just like to say that at the ACCT level, uh, ACCT just uh, joined two partnerships, one with uh, NALEO, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, and interestingly, uh, we're at the point now where about 19% or 2.4 million students of community college students are Latinos. And so this whole effort is to uh, develop a strategy which is, is called the, um, uh, the ACCT Naleo Prep Academy. And there will be a one-day seminar in conjunction with the National Legislative Summit in Washington, D.C. in February but to help boards uh, develop strategies to understand uh, the culture, the linguistics, the uh, teaching learning process for Latino students. Uh, another partnership that was just signed this week is with the Association of Colleges in the UK. Uh, Birmingham, England uh, was the site of the conference. And I think Dr. Korb, in light of your report on the community college <coughs> model for Pakistan, uh, the idea of this collaboration is to help understand internationally the impact that community colleges have uh, in their respective countries. And so we're excited about those two uh, partnerships. Thirdly, um, just as we've talked about a lot tonight, uh, at our ACCT conference in San Diego, uh, campus safety and campus security was a big topic, and that was just on the heels of Umpa Umpqua Community College shootings. Uh, it, it, it seems like a day doesn't go by where there is some threat. Uh, today there were two threats, one at Missouri Valley here in Marshall, Missouri. And uh, uh, so it, it seems as if that's becoming uh, a daily activity. So I really applaud our staff and our security team, our safety team, and all of the efforts we put on here in conjunction with our student senate, with our faculty senate and association to uh, do everything we can to make sure this campus is safe. It is a national discussion point, obviously. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, we bragged on you a little bit last month when you weren't here about your election to the as a Western District Board member to the National Board of the American Co Community College Trustees and also your immediate then assumption of the chair role in the Western District. I don't know if it's called district or whatever, but thank you for serving us on that national board. And those would be items to report on, I think, in the future with respect to KACCT. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I'm really interested for a number of reasons, but uh, I'm, I'm very interested in trustee development and uh, how we can uh, help the leadership of colleges at the trustee level drive this notion of teaching and learning. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Trustee Ingram, would you report on the Community College Foundation, please? I would be happy to. Um, the executive board meeting was held on November the 10th last week, and Trustee Cook and myself were in attendance at that meeting. We began with a presentation on the audit, and there are several different strategies that were discussed that the foundation will be looking at in the future with the anticipation that the uh, interest rates will raise in the near future. So that was good news to hear. But everything in the audit did look clean and clear. Um, we also heard a report on the foundation's annual dinner, which was held on this campus on October 20th. Highlights included the presentation of the foundation's colleague award to Emily Bierman for her years of service and partnership, and also the Hugh W. Spear Award for distinguished service to your former trustee, John Stewart, for his many years of outstanding service and leadership to the foundation. It was also announced that the 2014-2015 academic year, the JCCC Foundation, working with the college's finance office, awarded $1,077,000 to assist 1,085 JCCC students with tuition, books, and program needs. This is both the highest amount ever awarded and the most students ever to receive scholarships in the history of the foundation. The 29th Annual Sum Enchanted Evening Scholarship Gala was held this past Saturday. The event was chaired by Ramin and Ashley Cherifat with uh, Pam Pop serving as the scholarship chair. 
As was mentioned earlier in our meeting, Dr. Mary Davidson Cohen was honored as the Johnson Countyian of the Year. And again, uh, I will repeat more than $533,000 was raised to support scholarship scholarships, which is a record for the gala other than the 25th anniversary <coughs> year. Um, we did have eight $25,000 legacy scholarships uh, sponsors that were included in the packet uh, for your information. Those included BNSF Railway, Claire Blair, Blair Family Scholarship, Ben Craig, Friends of Barton P. Cohen, IBT Inc. in memory of Mark Byrne, the Kirk Foundation, Olathe Medical Center uh, Inc., and the Rainier Family Foundation. We also had four sunflower sponsors and three open petal sponsors. So that concludes my report. Any questions? Uh, yes, Dr. Just, Cook. Just a comment, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as Nancy and I sit in these foundation meetings, and um, you know, it's just it's just really inspiring to hear the foundation members talk about our mission statement of uh, inspiring learning to transform lives to strengthen communities. And uh, I just I really appreciate the effort that everybody makes to send that message every day. And it's really fun to see foundation board members from the community have that same thinking. And uh, we're, we're now just under $30 million in the foundation. And, uh, uh, but, but to, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a large amount. It's, it's grown very well. But the work that these foundation folks put in and people in the community put in to uh, help students have hope and find a way to, uh, to uh, strengthen uh, their community and, and transform their lives. So it's, it's really refreshing for us to observe that and the hard work they do. And we'd just like to thank the foundation and all the people that, that work diligently to see that students have a chance. Another example of volunteers in this community who get th something done without caring about who gets the credit. Um, we're ready for our consent agenda. The consent agenda is a number of routine and consensus items that are typically considered collectively and approved in a single motion and vote. Any member of the board may request that a particular item be removed from the consent agenda and considered, debated, and voted upon separately. Are there any members of the consent agenda that a board member would like to remove from the consent agenda and consider as a separate item? If not, do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda as printed? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried unanimously. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the meeting, <clears throat> we will have an executive session. I would like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of consultation with an attorney, which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship in order to protect the privilege and the board's communications with its attorney on legal matters, discussions concerning security and safety matters. This session will last no more than one hour and no action will be taken during the session. We would like to invite to join that session Joe Sopcich, Judy Korb, Barbara Larson, Tanya Wilson, Becky Sintlever, Rex Hayes, Tom Clayton, Paul Kyle, Greg Russell, and Elisa Pacer uh, to join the session. Uh, do I hear such a motion? So move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion's carried. We will, should, should we start at 635? Give everybody a chance for a minute. We'll start the session at 635. We will. I'll be back in open session no later than 7.35 p.m. Uh, we have returned to open session of our meeting at 7.35 p.m. after our one-hour executive session. We have additional matters to, to discuss in executive session, so I'm going to ask for a motion to return to executive session for the purpose of discussing consultation with an attorney, which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship in order to protect the privilege in the board's communications with its attorney on legal matters and as it pertains to discussions concerning safety and security matters. Uh, this session is intended to last no more than 30 minutes and no action will be taken during this session. We would like to invite Joe Sopcich, Judy Korb, Barbara Larson, Tanya Wilson, Becky Sentliver, Rex Hayes, Tom Clayton, Paul Kyle, Greg R Russell, and Alyssa Pacer to join this executive session. We were also joined toward the end of the last executive session by Trustee David Lindstrom. And I hear such a motion. So moved. Second. We moved by Trustee Ingram and seconded by Trustee Drummond. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried unanimously. We'll go immediately into executive session at 737. 
and be out of executive session no later than 707. Thank you. Excuse me, 807. Math challenged. 737 to 807. Thank you. We're back. We re we've returned from our second executive session. It's 8.06 or 7 by our clock. Uh, no action was taken during the executive session or either of the two executive sessions. Uh, we're now prepared for a motion to adjourn. Do I hear a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. We adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. We are adjourned. Thank you all.